Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. And I'm Jenna Million. And this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll also let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. Fun reminder that we have cool bonus content over at patreon.com slash name three songs. Or if you just feel like leaving us a tip because you enjoyed this episode, you can do that at paypal.me slash name three songs. So Sarah, what are we getting into today? Because I think we have a very special, unique episode going on. I'm so excited. So today we are actually joined by one of my favorite artists, Fifi Dobson. And basically like since the early days of the podcast, when we were like putting together our list of who we wanted to come talk to us, I was like, we have to talk to Fifi Dobson. And Fifi was basically getting her fame around the same time as Avril Lavigne. She's a pop rock artist based in Canada and her career has definitely had lots of ups and downs to say the least because she She's a half black woman from Canada who was creating music in a genre that at the time genres were so specific. You had to take so many boxes to fit within genres that they really just tried to pigeonhole her into sort of like an R&B pop singer because of her look matched with her voice. And she very much just was like, that's not me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be a rock star. And after speaking with her, it very much is clear that sort of everything really really just like fell into place perfectly but also not but like everything sort of just like fell into place in the way that the world was sort of giving her the signs that like yes Fifi you are supposed to be a rock star and I think that's just pretty incredible like how much she has been able to achieve in her career through all the hardships that she's been through through all the stuff that the label she's been on have put her through because she wasn't meeting like a quota or like a pre-existing idea of what you're supposed to be to do what she was doing. Yeah, very much so. I mean, her story is crazy. I mean, they called her Brandy Spears because she had a pop voice, but she was a black girl. And it's so cool to me that at such a young age, she said she was 16, that she was able to know that what they were trying to have her do didn't feel right. She didn't feel right doing like pop R&B music. She very much wanted to do rock music. And I think it's just really cool. She recognized that and was able to stick to that and found people that were able to help her along in, in being her true authentic self the whole time it's incredible and just kind of like all inspiring how her as a pop rock act sort of came to be and she goes a bit into this when we're talking to her later but she was recording for like when a label signs you especially back then they would sort of not boot camp but they would train you up to sort of figure out who you're supposed to be they're cultivating the idea of this new artist that they signed and so she was creating music in a studio and there was this group called Prozac and like the studio next door and they were a pretty big deal in Canada at the time and they heard her and they were like hey we need like a female vocalist to come sing on this pop rock song and she went and she did it and they were kind of like you should not be singing the music we heard you singing in that recording studio you should be singing this music because this is clearly where you're in your power and like where your voice fits and all that sort of stuff and she's like well yeah that's that's what I want to do she's talked in other interviews and stuff about how like when she was a kid her older sister would be playing rock music in her room and she would like sit outside her sister's room and eavesdrop on the music and be like oh man this is so cool this is what I want this is what I need to be and so she like got a guitar and taught herself a guitar and I mean when she was first starting making music (laughs) in order to get noticed by record labels she would record herself doing karaoke and send it out to labels and that's literally how she essentially got discovered at the start was just by literally sending in recordings of her doing karaoke but yeah eventually she did get to be in the right place at the right time and created a whole pop rock album and got a meeting set up with Island Def Jam's like Canadian sort of leg and after just performing one song they were like get that paper book started up we need to sign this woman like (laughs) old teenager we need to sign this girl i mean they weren't wrong i mean her music is pretty incredible and i think thankfully pop punk pop rock was really making a lot of waves at that time so she really was in the right place at the right time for a lot of this stuff because i think based off of other people even nowadays who have very much so been pigeonholed by labels who the label signed them and be like we believe in you you're talented and then just sort of shelf them and are like you have to 
to do everything we want you to do or else we're never going to put your music out into the world. She, in a lot of ways, got really lucky, even though it didn't 100% wind up in her favor for a good amount of years. Yeah, I mean, talking to her, it is kind of crazy she managed to avoid the whole stereotype, pop star, all do what we want you to do thing. But I will say my favorite fun fact about Fifi Dobson is that at that time when she was doing karaoke songs and sending them in and stuff, she also wrote songs for a boy band in her local town. I think that's so funny. She like mailed them songs and they like actually turned it into a song. I just love that a boy band showed up to her house and she was like 15 and they're like, we're here because you wrote us letters with lyrics. (laughs) She's like, cool, let's get to work, boys. Just imagine. Oh, what a, I mean, that should be a movie itself. (laughs) So we do keep mentioning hardships when we've just talked about how incredible she is. But so in 2005, she was meant to release her sophomore album, which was called Sunday Love. And literal days before the album was supposed to come out, the label was basically just like, sorry, this release has been canceled. There were production issues and the album just got shelved. And for a long time, her fans and her as an artist were just like, wow, this album's never going to be heard. And Island Def Jam wound up dropping her. And so she like goes back to Canada and is kind of like, well, what am I supposed to do now? And then a few years later, she is watching music videos on the TV and she hears Miley Cyrus singing one of the songs that was supposed to be on her album. And rather than be like, I need to call the label, I need to like deal with this, why is Miley singing my song? She took it as a sign that she's supposed to be doing music again. And this sort of pushed her towards the direction to start writing again. And she actually went on to get re-signed by Def Jam. She put out her third album, but technically her second album called Joy in 2010. And so her career was able to start over because... Miley Cyrus was singing her song. And I just think that that's really incredible because like we've talked about a lot, there was that point in time where pop punk, pop rock was what everybody was doing. And I feel like all the Disney girls had at least one pop punk foray. Yeah. <laughs> like, sort yeah. of song. They're like, let's dip our toe in this. Let's get some extra highlights. Let's do some pop rock stuff. And so again, for Fifi, everything sort of fell into place when it was supposed to so that she could continue to give the world her music which i think is just pretty incredible most definitely i mean as i said just such a cool example of sticking to your guns throughout the music industry which if you're a listener of our pod you know we're all about that and cool to bring it back around and see how women are also doing that nowadays so i think you guys are really going to enjoy this conversation and learn a lot so without further ado big welcome to fifi dobson Fifi, thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited to get into this conversation with you. Me too. I'm stoked. So we're just going to jump straight in to the questions because we've just given everybody a Fifi Dobson 101 lesson. (laughs) So everybody knows who you are and everything about you. It's like everybody's your number one fan at this point, (laughs) which I think is the best way to do things. So with all that being said, since pop music right now has sort of been breaking like tons of boundaries and pop punk has been making such a big research with not just men but also women involved in this and in the early 2000s when you were first coming out with music you were obviously doing pop punk rock sort of genre of music but nowadays there's very much a boundaryless sort of aspect to how music is running compared to when you were coming up in the scene and so with that being said do you think that the genre pigeonholing that happened sort of back then is still happening now and if not do you think that there's more of an opportunity uh, for people who like don't really fit within a label to have more success in music than when you were sort of coming up in the music scene well to me I honestly think the lines have been completely blurred with genre you know I don't think there's such thing really as genre anymore when I came out you were a specific genre you were pop rock you were R&B pop you know I was pop rock I still am pop rock in my brain you know, how I create, but the lines are so blurred. You can do anything, you know, you can have a record with Travis Barker and then do a record with Chris Brown or whoever on the same album. And people don't judge that the same way they used to back in the day if you cross genres. I think that that now artists have more freedom to express themselves musically to do whatever they really want 
you know? Why do you think that is? Like, what do you think changed in order for that to happen? Time and life situations and more acceptance, I would say. And I, and I, I, and I mean that with just human acceptance, more human acceptance. I mean, clearly we've gone through such horrible and crazy times to get to where we are now over the many years, but it's not even a but, it's really just, we've gone through so much as a human race. But I think music is reflecting that as well. Yeah, definitely. I think that like, and we talk about this a lot, but in like the past decade, so much has moved forward from where people had to be so pigeonholed just like in existence. And I think a lot of it has to do with just social media and artists sort of having more of the opportunity to create transparency between them and their fans. And it's given a lot of people sort of the opportunity to like create music that they are a fan of rather than what they think that people want. Because I know when I was growing up and would inter- like talk to bands and whatever, there are a lot of people who'd be like, yeah, I don't listen to this stuff. I just make this because that's what's cool right now. So I feel like there's a less of that feeling of having to create what's cool and you can just create what you like. Yeah. You know, when you make music, you do it because you love it. So you should create something you want to love, <laughs> in my opinion. I feel like the record labels are always the last one to hop on that train of thought because marketing 101, you got to put a label on it for it to be successful, unfortunately. But I guess so like right now, we're kind of seeing this resurgence of, you know, pop rock or pop punk. And we've seen artists like Willow, Girl in Red, even Olivia Rodrigo bringing in these elements into her music, as well as people like Taylor Momsen. And so they're really playing with these rock sounds and pop sounds, kind of like we said, without, well, like while blurring these genres. But this time around, it feels like there's a lot more women at the forefront of this movement where women haven't always been recognized or given space within the kind of like pop rock, pop punk sphere. So yeah, I guess I'm curious if you have any thoughts about these girls who are now kind of claiming this genre as their own. I think it's amazing. You know, I think it was needed and it was only a matter of time honestly for things to come back around you know everything resurfaces and like comes back through so it's like it was only a matter of time and i'm glad that it's happening and i think girls need it i think females need it i think guys need it too because they need men (laughs) but i think women need it because the one thing about artists like that and girls being able to express themselves in rebellious ways and honest ways is very important for young girls kick down doors and express how they feel yeah completely because i think growing up also there was so much and still is in pop rock and pop punk so much internalized misogyny and outright misogyny in song lyrics and just the scene in general that even when there were women coming up there were like a good portion of us who liked that music who were like i don't know if i should listen to this because the dudes we've been listening to this whole time were kind of like girl against girl girls can't have each other's backs because you have to fight for our affection with each other yeah i'm not about that world i feel like honestly it's so refreshing to me and I was actually talking to some ladies about this recently is that I think women are celebrating each other a lot more these days and I think that's so important that we have each other's backs and that we respect each other and we elevate each other it's so very very important oh a million percent and that's I think like Jenna and I are very passionate about that and sort of being very loud about the fact that we're unlearning the internalized misogyny that we're all sort of programmed with because I feel like that's also something that people don't really realize that like it's not really our fault because that's just what we're fed into in all forms of media and I mean it sort of happens to everyone because I mean even with you in coming up at the start of your career like you were given the opportunity to do the music that you liked because Avril Lavigne was being so successful but then they were just like oh well there's already Avril Lavigne but I mean Avril Lavigne was 60% ballads 40% sort of more pop rock and then you were just like pop rock and I feel like you were different enough that there should have been room for both of you at the table but I guess looking back at it now or even at that time like do you feel like there could have been more to be done to make space for more women in that genre and more space for you in that genre? Well, Avril and I came out the same time. I had a song called Bye Bye Boyfriend in Canada, and then I had my first single in the U.S. was Take Me Away, so it was just different timing, but it was the same time at the same time, if that makes sense. Just different singles uh, for different countries. But I love Avril. You know, I loved Avril when I saw what she was doing. I was... I remember the first time I actually saw her, though, I was like, oh, my God, am I going to compete with this girl? Like, 
she, you know, she looks so rad and she's so beautiful. And I'm just this black girl from Scarborough. I got curly ponytail. I don't even know what to do with it. And I just felt, oh, you know, she was wearing dickies. I was wearing dickies, but her dickies fit so differently because I've got hips, you know. And in that genre, there was no one for me really to look to to say, hey, you look like me in this genre, in that specific genre. But there were lots of girls that came out that were awesome. Michelle Branch, even Ashley Simpson did her thing, you know, those songs were amazing. There were a lot of really cool girls. Katie Rose, who was artist from California, and she had a couple of songs that were really rad that I got to, well, I got to tour with her a few times. But there were a lot of chicks that were just killing it. Yeah, because I think that like people tend to forget how many women were doing things because people, especially when they look back on music from back then, they're kind of like, well, what was on the radio? And then what was the success after that? And I feel like when the radio ruled prior to streaming and all that sort of stuff, there's not as much to be able to be like, oh, yeah, like their careers were still successful. Because I mean, Michelle Branch, I think, still tours and a lot of these artists are still putting out music and doing stuff. But people just remember the one or two songs that were on the radio and they're like, oh, okay there was no room for them and so I feel like their stories sort of get pushed to the side because people just base so much on like radio fame from the early 2000s I mean Michelle Branch had hits you know yeah and Venice Carlton and like so many cool females I think that everybody has a time and that that time can come again you know Michelle Branch I, I believe is out in Nashville where I'm living as well and I'm sure she's making a new album. I'm sure she has her following. But it's just about a song. Like, you just never know. Like, she, you know, she might put out a song next month. It's like, again, back on the top. Like, it, you just don't know. Because right now, it's, about, it's a song market, you know? Yeah, it really is. Honestly, just crazy the way streaming has changed things to, as you said, the song market of singles being so important. And I think one of the things that was really interesting with Olivia Rodrigo was like, there was all this buzz about TikTok and like the drama that happened with her high school musical thing. But all of this internet buzz really led her first singles to be really successful. And then of course her album after that as well. Yeah, for sure. So with our podcast, we often talk about how young people in the industry get taken advantage of quite easily. And it seems like, you know, you came in as a teenager and you were able to have a lot of control over your, well, it seems like a lot of creative control over your sound and writing your own songs. And of course you were originally kind of, people were wanting you to be an R&B artist, but you were able to like stick to your roots and do what you want to do, which was pop rock. So I guess like thinking about being such a young woman in the industry, do you ever feel like there was a point where when you were making your records that you had to fight for your voice or fight to have that creative control? For sure. I mean, the minute I started dealing with any sort of label when I was young, this is before I signed out on Def Jam. This was just when I was developing and I just got recognized, I guess is whatever they call it. And I was making karaoke tapes and that's how I got noticed by a Canadian label in Canada. And naturally you go into a development deal where they set you up with writers and try to figure out what sound you are. When I was doing that with them, I just, with that label, I just didn't, something felt so wrong, you know, it just didn't feel right. And the music sounded wrong. My vocals sounded wrong. I just knew if I did it, it was over before it started. So I went into the studio to cut some vocals with uh, this writer who actually is dope, but like he was just making the music he thought I was supposed to make and, um, or was told to make me. And two writers next door heard me singing and they asked me to come by and cut vocals for a demo they were doing for Hollywood Records, I believe it was. And it was a for Prozac project. And um, I sang the vocal and Jay Levine, who was actually the artist from Prozac, uh, was like, hey, look, I think you're doing the wrong music. You know, I, I think that you want to do rock pop like I can tell in your voice you know and I was like yeah man I've been trying to tell everybody like I want guitars and I just want like raw vocals and no one's listening to me and I don't know what to do and he's just like well look I'll make the album you want to make I can't promise you'll get signed I can't promise you that will go anywhere but if you want to make this rock pop shit then like I'll do it and I was like deal I was like, I'm in. And um, that was that. And I left the uh, the development deal with Zomba and started working with Jay and James on the first album that you hear today. So when, because I know that Jive was sort of the one that we were being like, okay, we want you to do like R&B pop because you Well, it, it, was Zomb- it was Zomba. So Jive is the U.S. Um, label okay. and Zomba was the Canadian label. And so I, I hadn't yet crossed over to Jive yet. 
I was okay. still working with Zamba. And it wasn't that they wanted me to do R&B. It's that they coined me Brandy Spears. Was yeah. She's a black girl with a quote-unquote pop white voice as what they heard and mm -hmm. it was one thing that I, that nickname that stuck with me since I was young because when I heard it and it never really left my brain <laughs> because it was crazy I never heard anything like it you know but yeah I wouldn't say that they said oh you're doing R&B I would just say that they didn't understand how to navigate musically with a black girl with the voice that I had they didn't know where to place it that makes sense thank you <laughs> Yeah, no worries. But yeah, because I feel like it's just so, it's so interesting that they like saw you and you were like, well, I have this music that I'm interested in because you haven't spoken a lot about how you sort of felt the most you like when you were doing rock music and that it felt yeah. like you, who you were supposed to be sort of thing and I mean as I had mentioned earlier like with social media and everything that's going on like there has been a lot more transparency from artists speaking out about the way that labels run and there have been like countless documentaries and other things sort of pulling back the curtain on the way the music industry handles things and why sometimes you'll have an artist come out with a single you'll be like obsessed with them and then you never hear from them again and I mean there's been a lot of talk recently because Mickey Guy in with performed at the Grammys and how there's also this artist in England right now called Ray who just released a single who has been held by her label for like six years because they were like oh well you're a person you're, you're a woman of color but you also are ambiguous in your ethnicity because we know how everybody is like the Kardashians have changed what's acceptable for beauty you know <laughs> so she wanted to do R&B music and they're like no you look like a pop star and we can sell that and so I guess when you were so young and made the decision to sort of step away from these people who didn't understand you and move to other people. Is there like any advice or any thoughts behind what's going on right now and like how you were able to sort of navigate away from people being like, we don't know what to do with you and you being like, well, I know what to do with me and these people know what to do with me. So I'm going to work with them. That's a good question. I mean, for me, honestly, it was just really my instincts. It was my gut. Uh, it was my intuition. You know, it, it wasn't something I can really describe because I was so young. You know, I was only like 16 years old. So I don't know why I decided to take the leap of faith with Jane and James, but I do know that it seemed right and my heart told me to do it. And um, what's the worst that can happen when you follow your gut, you know? Like, you know, your route might change a bit and it might take you a little longer or it might take you faster to get there. So at that time, because, I mean, it's really crazy to think that you had that intuition, which is really special that you were able to recognize that. Because I feel like a lot of young artists get caught up in like, well, this is my only opportunity. If this record label is telling me this, I have to do what they're saying. Otherwise, I may never make it or, you know, whatever the situation situation is do you feel like you went through any of those emotions or you just knew like you were just like if it happens great if it doesn't also I want to do I want to be true to me I never thought like that as a kid. I was so determined that that would, was a hiccup, you know? I mean, I had to try... I was fighting to get to even that place for so long that that wasn't going to stop me. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, no, it's, it's really cool to hear you say that just because, like, Sarah and I talked about this with, like, Disney pop stars of, like, people who get sucked into Disney Channel and then they get signed to a record deal and then it doesn't turn out to be what they really want it to be. So I, I think it's really cool that you were able to recognize that so early on and find people who believed in you to help you make the music that you wanted to really be making most definitely there's been a lot of blessings that have come in and out you know throughout the years and that's like that was definitely a blessing having jay and james in the other room hearing me um saying and bringing me on board that was for sure so i do have a question that if you're comfortable talking about because i know with sunday love it was supposed to come out and there was the whole thing with you was it dropped or what happened and that just for clarification. Sunday, yeah, Sunday Love was the second album, uh, was supposed to yeah. be the second album. And I went to LA, I wrote it, worked on it for a while, worked with some really great rock producers and rock writers because I wanted to make more of a, an authentic rock album and a harder rock album. And uh, it just, by the time we were ready for the sec second single, we put Don't Let It Go To Your Head. I think This Is My Life is going to be the second single off that off that album. But, you know, logistics happen, you know, and things happen behind closed doors. And one of the things that was said was the album was too dark. And I can definitely agree the album's dark because I was very honest and I expressed myself in a very honest way. I think I might, it might be the, one of the most honest albums I've ever done and good and bad to conversations conversations I had with significant others and like everything in those songs are so blunt. 
even if it's poetic, it's blunt. And um, it was just, it, I was told it was too, or looking back now, I was told um, as an adult that that album was just too dark and that they didn't think I knew who I was. And <clears throat> so they dropped the album or they shelved the album and then dropped dropped me. And it was a very devastating moment. You know, you're not only does your music get put to the side and everything you worked on and everything you did and all your like hard work, whatever. But then, you know, I went back home to Toronto from LA and just sat there and was like, what am I going to do? Like music has always been my everything. It's not a side hustle it's everything it's all i know it was my hustle to get out of my home and it was my hustle to survive it's everything so when i had to go back home it was like a real moment of like i don't know what to do with myself and i got really like in my own head and really sad and but there was i talked about blessings earlier there you know, I was in the other room in my in my loft and heard much music playing in the other room. And then when I went in, it was a song, well, it was Start All Over playing, which is a song I actually worked on and co-wrote for my album Sunday Love, which didn't come out. And Miley was singing it and it was her music video. And I don't know how I forgot that I signed off on her doing it, but I, I guess I forgot. I was in a weird time. I was, a, it was a, I was in a weird place then, so I, I, you know, whatever. But it was a blessing. It was a moment for me to go, wow, like here she is doing this song and it, put a fire under me it reignited what was lost and then I started working on joy and I went to LA and worked on I want you and watch me move and through that process and all of a sudden you know as a blonde came out which was the, is the first song Austin they love and my, uh, Selena Gomez covered it on her album and then from there Jordan Sparks covered don't let it go to your head and it was just all these blessings that were like real reminders to me like man these songs weren't they weren't shit like they were actually pretty good because these girls are singing them and they're loving them so everything happens for a reason and I've realized that um as time has progressed of little things that happen that you think like oh shit it's this is the end or I've never actually I've never given up I've never been like oh this is the end of the road I'm not doing music anymore ever ever but it was definitely moments of like well I guess I'll just disappear for a while but then these things happen and they just remind you and they put you back on track and they keep you going the process of getting re-signed to a label for joy was that something that was like not to be tongue-in-cheek but like was that like a joyous occasion or was that something that you were kind of like oh wow like they're taking me serious again or like what was the initial reaction to getting that opportunity to go and put new music out again because it was the same label was it not yeah so you know watch me move and i want you was getting a lot of love and i was in a more joyful place you know i just was i felt like i had gotten through fire and i felt like an i don't know i felt just uh stronger and refreshed and i just felt joy and so that's why i named it that and yeah i re-signed with island Def jam and then the story continued <laughs> I mean, I think that that's really exciting in a lot of ways, because I mean, I know that later on they did, like, Sunday Love was able to be heard, which is one of my personal favorite albums, so I'm very happy <laughs> that it was able to be heard by the world, but I mean, that was like another sort of surprise to you, right? Like, you weren't expecting that to be put out ever, right? Yeah, I mean, had I been able to put it out the way I wanted to, the cover art is completely different. There's a lot of things that are, that would have been a lot different different that would explain my story a little bit more when there were cds or when cd well, there are still cds but when cds mattered um there was my insert was really really telling and I, I worked really hard which is not it's not a big deal i'll continue to do that but like for that album specifically my goal was to to really let people understand my childhood and uh, the art really reflected that and uh no one got to see that maybe one day Maybe one, one day. I think you can find little bits and pieces of it on the internet, but um, it was fire. It was fire, the shit we were working on. It was so cool. There's a Fifi Dobson exclusive out there waiting to be uncovered. <laughs> I have it. I have, like, the original insert that's still paper because it's not, like, hadn't been put through, you know, the whole process. So I have, like, the original layout. It's crazy. Wow. It sounds like you're going to have to do, like, a 15-year anniversary of, like, when it was supposed to come out. Be like, here's the present. 
here you go maybe so you had just mentioned like you're talking about these blessings or like these moments throughout your life that made you realize like your love of music and wanting to continue to pursue that so i'm curious if there was any particular instance or anything that kind of inspired you as of recently to like want to put out your next record it's just time i i mean i've lived life i've gone through some more stuff that i could talk about i you know i it's just time, honestly. Uh, I got the energy to do it. I want to do it. I, I have a lot to, to say. Um, and it's been a crazy few years since Legacy, which was really my last um, Legacy and In Better Hands were like my last singles dropped videos. I did um, Save Me From LA, but that was more of an experimental kind of track. Um, but yeah, it's just it's, I'm just ready. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And then also, I saw like in a recent interview, you had mentioned like you had been working on writing with Austin Mahone. And then of course, previously you mentioned the Miley Cyrus song. So I'm curious, are you in a different mindset when you're writing for someone else versus writing for yourself? 100%. If if, if, if it's like a session for another artist, you got to kind of get into the brain of that artist, you know, and, and see what they want to talk about. And that's very important because I, you know, for me, I wouldn't want to sing anything that I wasn't. Well, first of all, I, I I'm hands on on all my stuff so that it reflects me and all the songs reflect me and what I'm going through. But for other artists, when you're doing that, you got to respect that process for them. And um, for start all over and stuff like that, those songs were actually written for me. You know that we pit that were pitched afterwards. So it's a different that's different because that's you know she's singing about one of my breakups. You know yeah. what I mean? So. <laughs> that must be kind of surreal <laughs> to hear somebody else yeah, about your funny. your personal experience. Yeah, it's funny. Cool. Is that a weird situation when like you do have experience writing for people, so you sort of make yourself not the character, you create other things to then hear people singing your own songs and taking, especially like with Jordan Sparks's cover, like she's sort of made it her own, but she's still singing your story. So is that sort of weird hearing your... I, it sort of makes me feel like m like myths of like there is the originator of the myth and as it sort of goes on it sort of changes meaning is that sort of similar to what it's like when somebody covers your song in the sort of way that she did where she sort of made it her own but was still your music or was supposed to be no it's it's beautiful it's beautiful yeah. it's a great feeling it's a surreal feeling it's it's hard to explain really it's just super cool super cool i think it's always really interesting and pretty beautiful like when there are such special covers of songs because I mean like hallelujah for so many people it's like who a lot of people don't even know who sang that song originally because it's been covered by so many people and so many people have like made it their own so I think it's really interesting like hearing you talk about hearing these other women cover your songs and how it sort of reinvigorated your want to go and create new music and that you felt like it was a blessing because I feel like some people would be really just mad rather than be like this is what I needed to hear right now so I think that that's just really incredible hearing your viewpoint on that. Songs are meant to be heard. That's how I feel. I think that that's a very powerful statement. <laughs> Yeah, that's really incredible. And I think that also sort of goes back to how we were saying before, like sometimes you don't need to create unnecessary issues between the other women in music. Because I feel like so often it's like, oh no, a feud now. And it's like, no, it's just people celebrating music that they love. Yeah, it's not necessary to, to make it a, not necessary for any of us to make it a negative thing. It's like, you know, we're all just trying to, I don't know, we're just trying to make good art. And like, if I did something that was, good to someone else and they want to share it then hell yeah so when you were younger i know on most of the like liner notes like you're listed as a first writer for all the songs was it hard to convince your label to let you have that control in the writing room as like a young woman in music at all no because we wrote most of the album before we even brought it to island def jam so on the first album we made that album before we even got involved with the label we we had to take me away and a few others after the fact but we, yeah we already established that early on that's really awesome i feel like for so many things like girls show up and they're like okay here's <laughs> here's a list of things we want from you but it's just like i don't know your whole your career has been really i think inspiring so it's just really awesome thank you. to hear it thank you and so also with talking about 
new music. I mean, as you said, people haven't heard that much from you other than you did that song recently for the film Unpregnant, and then you had See Me From LA, but as you said, that was more of like a experimental sort of music. So with, I know that you have stuff coming out in like the next few no- months or so, and so what can people expect from your new music? Are you going to be like sticking to the pop rock sound? Are you moving away and sort of living within that genreless world that's been created over the past couple of years? Or like, what's the plan for that? What can we expect? Well, I'm still creating it right now. <laughs> I'm in Miami at the moment. I have a session in a few hours. So um, I'm actually, I'm right in the middle. I'm smack in the middle of it. And it's definitely always going to have guitars and edge and you know, it's just who I am. It's not even like a, a sign for me anymore. It's just, I can't go on stage without without it, honestly. Just expect, you know, um, a lot of, uh, of my honest opinion. And like, I wear my heart on my sleeve, you know, that's me. That's always been me. My heart has guided me, good and bad. And it continues to be the hot topic of my songs for some reason. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I just, I let love hold the guitar and the mic a lot of times. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what comes out of this whole shebang. Is there any aspect of once you do get to the point of releasing music or planning for the release that you're most excited for, whether that be the creative process behind doing visuals for the album, like you were mentioning before about Sunday Love or touring, or is there any specific aspect that makes you the most excited about putting out new music? Yeah, I can't wait to tour. I mean, I love being on the road. I love doing shows. I love meeting new people, connecting. I miss that. I love it. That's probably one of my favorite parts other than like being on stage, other than like actually writing the music. So yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Are there any other things that you would want to mention and what we're talking about today? Or- I mean, I feel good. I feel like you guys touched on a lot of stuff. I have a new single coming out called Fucking in Love and that's hitting soon. We just shot a video for it. We're editing it at the moment. Well, since you just mentioned videos, because I know throughout your career, as we've said so much, like you very much so have been like, this is who I am. This is what I want to be. And you've followed that. So do you have that sort of control in all aspects of what you've been doing from like the writing room to to the visuals, to all that sort of stuff? Like, do you, are you picking your team? Like, is, is it mainly you being in charge of this stuff? Most definitely. I'm back with my original team and I couldn't be happier. And they let me, they really let me have my creative control and we go back and forth. We're a team though. Like, I trust their opinion to the highest as well. And I I go to them, I go to Danny a lot for, you know, and Chris and like, just my team. I love my team so much. And I do lean on them if I, you know, especially if I'm like, but I don't know, is it this picture or this picture? I don't know. Like, I don't know what to do. Is it this logo or this logo? And I trust their opinion. I trust their guidance. I trust where they're 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 guiding me and where they're taking me. And, and that's so important. So we're definitely going to be very excited to hear your new single, watch the music video and share it with all our listeners as well thank you fifi so much for joining us today thank you for having me guys that went so well (laughs) it was so great to hear her story hear her tell it in person and as i said like i think her career is such a great example of just challenging the norms of people wanting you to fit into a box sticking to your guns knowing yourself and being true to like your art and it's cool really cool what she said about writing songs is the most important like being true in your songwriting all of that yeah i'm just so thankful with like how much she was willing to share and provide because i feel like as a fan of hers i had so many not fully answered questions about what had happened throughout her career and why things sort of went the way that they did and so i think it's just incredible that she's willing and able to just be so open about her experience in the music industry because she has been thrown through a lot of loops <laughs> and now she's back creating music and happy doing it which i think is really incredible because there has been so many sort of pauses whether intentional or not in her career yeah most definitely i'm very excited to see what this new music video looks like i know i'm so pumped so we hope that you guys learned a lot from pp i feel like as i said like she shared a lot not just about herself but i think just about the music industry in general a lot that we can take away from this conversation and if you didn't know her already just go listen to her music it's all on spotify on 
Sunday Love, which did eventually come out digitally, so you can listen to it on Spotify. It is one of my favorite albums. Every song on that album is a good one. She did write the song Hole with Kay Hanley from Letters to Cleo, who is also the voice of Josie from Josie and the Pussycat. so you know you know how I feel about her. It all comes full <laughs> it's circle. It's a very good song. She worked with a lot of incredible people on that album, but I think that there are no misses when it comes to Fifi. So I think just find your soul song is my my direction to y'all. And then come let us know what song stood out the most to you from her music. Because I think that there's something for all of you, which I think is really incredible because I don't think a lot of artists can do that. So yeah, so you can come converse with us more about today's conversation. Let us know if you like the style that we're doing, if you had fun listening to it, because your feedback is really important to us. And you can do that at Name Three Songs on Instagram or Twitter, or you can come talk to us personally i am at sarah underscore fagan and jenna is at jenna underscore million so thanks for joining us on name three songs until next time never let anyone feel bad about your favorite band and remember you're never too cool to listen to phoebe dobson don't forget to subscribe to be notified when a new episode comes out and leave us a five-star review they really help if you want to find out more about anything we talked about today you can visit name three